don't say that. Sorry. You're, you're, you're good. You're not in trouble. Oh, I'm always in trouble. <laughs> so my, my family, I just got a, a text from Anne. She goes, you know, my marriage to the Robocop, the Terminator. <laughs> but I'm not sure why he's saying that. <laughs> I, I think I know why, though. Hey, 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 think of it as Reb and Uncle putting it into the bank and you taking it out for him. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a Board of Supervisors meeting, San Diego County, uh, on October 1st. Where has the year gone? Can we all rise and have the pledge led by Supervisor Munzer? Ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Thank you. Can I have a motion for a certificate of posting? So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, hearing none. Uh, now is the time for uh, public comment uh, that are for items that are not on the agenda. Uh, please keep your comments to three minutes or less. Dick Gallagher. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. How's everybody doing today? Good morning. Fantastic. Outstanding. Out. Can't be better. Great. Um, just want to let everybody know where Veterans Day Parade is coming up again. And curious about getting the Board of Supervisors sponsorship again this year. And uh, we get that from you guys every year. And this year we're honoring the Korean War veterans. Uh, reminder of the Veterans Day ceremony is at 1111, for the Vets Building. And this year, we're honoring the Korean War veterans. We have a lunch at noon and pray to follow at 1.30. So we sure would appreciate your support sponsoring us. That's all. Thank you very much. Do you have any, you have any questions? Any questions from the board? Uh, I, I know I got a, a notice uh, for participation in the parade, and I, I certainly appreciate that. And we, I think that's a great way to honor our veterans and I hope that all the citizens of, of our county turn out and uh, honor all of the veterans especially the Korean War veterans thank you very much for coming and um, informing us and every the public for, uh, about what's going on next month thank you very much Good morning, board. You guys probably remember me from years ago because I filed an appeal that came before you in the uh, matter of Leal Vineyards. I I'm here today to ask for your help. Um, we've had three seasons since you passed a uh, noise ordinance, but we have yet to actually receive any relief to the noise. Uh, the first season, 2011, you passed in the spring. Uh, we had to wait for equipment to be bought, and then the code enforcement officer was out on medical leave, so no enforcement took place that first season. Season. Last year, uh, no enforcement took. Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, out of respect to the gentleman coming up to I appreciate. I'm hearing a lot of back noise. Can we? Um, can uh, uh, Can we hold our conversations to a minimum, please? And, or if you could take it to the lobby, we uh, definitely would appreciate it. Thank you. 
Um, last year, 2012, I asked for relief and help, but code enforcement indicated that they were instructed not to take noise measurements at the property line. Instead, and they were instructed not to come out and take noise measurements when they were making loud noise, but rather to just come out randomly, which resulted in coming out on maybe a Thursday or Friday when there wasn't a loud event. Not all events are loud, but some are. Uh, and additionally, taking readings down the street uh, which really didn't do any good. So when 13 rolled around, I met with Gary Armstrong and Byron Turner, and I asked, you know, is there anything we can do? And I was basically told all I can do is just send them emails for the file to stick in the file that says, yeah, we've had another noisy event. Um, again, not all the events are noisy, but we have yet to receive any relief through the noise ordinance. Uh, last Friday night, uh, they were pulling over 75 decibels at 9 o'clock at night at our property line. Um, and it, 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 it devalues my property and really, I mean, I've got property rights just as he does. Um, and my wife's going to want to uh, share with you, I mean, they know that they're doing this. Um, and they admitted it this last Friday. But um, I really need your help to either direct staff to uh, actually do some enforcement on this issue or uh, to ask to open his uh, use permit for review. Um, those permits are not reviewed uh, annually, as I th I've come to learn. I know talking to one of the planning commissioners, they thought that they were. Um, but this has been allowed to go on. There were, almost there were over 400, almost 500 people at Friday night's event. And his head count is limited to uh, close to half of that. Um, I, it, it, I don't want this thing to end up in litigation. I don't want to end up suing the county. It's, I mean, you're, it's my county too, but, but I need some help uh, in getting a resolution of this matter, and, and I haven't been able to get it with staff, and that's why I'm here today to ask if you guys can either uh, put it on the agenda or direct staff to provide some relief. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll consider it. Michelle Lee. We all know that Bill's tried to pursue this from the legal options that exist for us as members of this community and as of this county. And we've been met with some frustration. We've, we've not asked for anything um, that's favoritism to us. We haven't asked for preferential treatment. We've simply asked for our rights to be considered just as Mr. Leal's rights are considered. Um, there is a, a legal um, process to everything, but there's also a human common sense approach to some things. Um, we have a six-year-old son that's hearing impaired. He wears hearing aids. He's required to sit in the front of the classroom due to his hearing issues. Friday evening, we're in our home. Doors are closed. Windows are closed. Uh, we run our air conditioner because we can't r open the windows in the, in the hot summertime because of the noise. We're doing our part to try to close the noise into our own space. And at 9.30 at night, my child who doesn't have his hearing aids in, who's in the quietest room of the house, can't go to sleep. We're laying in his bed together singing moves like Jagger. That's too loud, folks. That's too loud. Um, I, as a mom trying to get my kid to sleep, what are my options and who do I call at 9.40 at night? Can't call the sheriff. They're not going to do anything. They've made that clear. Code enforcement is non-existent at 9.40 at night, and they're not going to come when there is noise. So I'm left to call Leal direct. We all know um, Mr. Leal's opinion of me. I'm the fat effing heifer. Let us not forget who I'm deemed in this community. Um, and I had called, and I talked to Owie. And I said, uh, Owie, it's loud. He goes, I know, Michelle. I know it's loud. He said, it was, it was a little bit less loud. We, we got him to knock it back down 30%, but it's gone back up, hasn't it? And I said, yeah, I'm just trying to get my kid to bed, buddy. Can you, can you turn it back down? I know you're getting ready to shut down. And I will say that the 10 p.m. cutoff does exist, and they do abide by that. For that, we're fortunate. But I'm resorted to call them to beg to turn it down. By the time they turn it down, it's the end of the event, and it's going right back up. Saturday evening, there was another event. We came home, we stood in our driveway, and we went, is there an event? Oh yeah, there is. I expect to hear noise. I expect to hear music. I expect to hear people. But I don't think it's fair to expect us to not be able to sleep and to not be able to put our kids to sleep because it's so loud in our home and we're far beyond any reasonable decibels. If these decibels existed in the city, 
Westrick would be out there and it'd be all over Facebook that people were having a loud party and it would be shut down. County's got a different set of rules. We want the rules that exist to be applied and, and to give us some relief on this. We can't build, we can't expand, we can't use our property for what we purchased it for. Um, he built an ag building recently, this spring, and there's a huge parking lot that came with that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Marty Richmond. Good morning, Ms. Uh, Ms. Chairman, members of the board. Marty Richmond from Hollister. Uh, uh, last meeting that you had, you had a lot of public comment concerning uh, uh, the cost to the employees uh, because they were asked to pay some of their retirement and some of their health care. And uh, they came up and uh, said uh, essentially they don't want to do it. They'd be happy to help you uh, increase the taxes upon the people in the county, uh, use their facilities use their political clout, I think is the term they used, to increase the taxes so that they wouldn't have to pay that part because times are tough for them. Well, I want to point out that we owe them a lot of money. We owe them more than $25 million in arrears we are on their lifetime health care, which this county went into debt to support that health care. We went into $33 million worth of debt in today's dollars. We still owe them $25 million, and they would like us to ignore that amount we owe them and pay them more up front, and then they will collect what we owe them when the time comes. Is that really the way you would do it if it was your own money? If you had a, a credit card bill, is that the way you would do it? Would you really just spend all your money and just leave the bill there to accumulate interest and then have somebody come in and say, okay, now I'm ready to collect. I want my money. This is ridiculous. The pri three primary benefit package, the health care, the retirement, and the lifetime health care, just the current payments, not what we're in arrears, come to an average of 29000 Four hundred and something dollars per employee. Now, I don't blame the employees who came up here for saying we don't want to count that as income. The IRS doesn't count it as income. It's tax free. They don't want to count that as income. But they came in and they said, "Oh, we see the county shipped two hundred ninety-five million dollars worth of agriculture. We want to count that as income." Even the IRS doesn't work like that. They at least try to find out if you made any money before they tax you. The SEIU wants to come in here and tax you without worrying about whether you made any money or not. They want to tax you on the gross. This is preposterous. This is the world's best retirement plan. Believe me, I know it because I got the second best. So I'm, I know that's the best. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Marvin Jones. The United Nations Interagency Panel on Climate Control put out their annual put out their report recently, saying that uh, the humans are the culprits for global warming. Uh, we may very well be the culprits for increasing uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We most probably are with all the fossil fuels we burn, but. Uh, I think we have to consider that report as a uh, political document. It was, uh, it ignored some of the scientific information like it hadn't warmed, the global temperatures remained constant for, the, for almost two decades. Well, they cherry picked that out. They did not include that. So what I got for you was today's graph on the polar ice coverage, and I apologize, uh, the running out of ink and Staples didn't open till nine o'clock. Uh, but on the Northern Hemisphere, you can see that the ice 
coverage has already started increasing again, that faint yellow line near the, near the bottom of the <coughs> curve there, that uh, is probably back comparable to what it was six or 18 years ago at this time of year. And that uh, uh, it has, as I say, started its routine increasing in ice coverage. If you turn on the other side, you've got the Antarctic, it's still freezing. Normally it is uh, started thawing by this time that the ice coverage has started decreasing and that uh, as you can see there that that it is still right up near an all time high for ice coverage in the southern hemisphere. Uh, global warming I'm not sure that uh, again that IPCC report uh, was a was more political. It was not a scientific report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else uh, who would like to address the board at this time? If not, yes, please come to the podium and uh, maybe afterwards fill out a little card for our clerk. If you have one, that would be great to pass it to her. Do you want to do public comment yes. besides item number two? Yes. Okay. Honorable supervisors and members of the public, my name is Bill Freitas. I'm with SEIU Local 521. And I am here today to speak on item number 20 on the agenda, which um, if we're speak, uh, we'll have an opportunity for the public to address that item. This is strictly for items not on okay. the agenda. Thank Fine. you. Anyone else? If not, we'll move on to department head announcements. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, we do have a few. Um, item number 15 and uh, 24, we're going to go ahead and continue those items for our next meeting, October 15th. We're going to continue item 15. And as well as 24, we're going to go ahead and strike that Four. from today's meeting. It's a closed session item. We also have um, Director of COG, Lisa Reinheimer. She has a, a department head announcement. Uh, Supervisor De La Cruz. I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, what was the question? Pardon me? What was your, what did you raise my name? Oh, I thought you had something. No, no, oh, okay. no, no. I'm sorry, I apologize. No. All right. Sorry about that, hearing things. Uh, Lisa? <laughs> yes, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair, Supervisors, members of the public. My name is Lisa Reinheimer, Executive Director of the San Benito Council of Governments, and I'm here again to um, give a plug and shameless self-promotion for um, a couple of things. The first is, uh, for the first time, we are offering, the County Express uh, Local Transit System is offering a free shuttle to the county fair. And there are four stops in Hollister, Vets Park, 4th and San Benito Street, the Health Foundation, and Kmart. Um, and we have a schedule uh, back in the uh, lobby and you, you can get dropped off directly at the front entrance of the county fair. So we're hoping that um, the times are convenient for folks and that you'll pass this all information on to your constituents, your friends, family, and what have you. And then you don't have to pay for parking and deal with all that craziness at the county fair. So we're really pleased to offer this this year. Um, and then the other um, self-promotion that I wanted to alert you to, again, is we are um, encouraging folks on International Walk to School Day to walk to school on October 9th. And uh, folks can register to um, win a $200 gift card from Swank Farms if they register for a walking school bus. And that is a group of students walking along a well-planned route with, a, with meeting points along the way to school. So we hope you'll pass that on to your friends, family, and constituents, and help promote Walk to School Day. And that's all I had today. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's all the announcements we have. OK. I, I see uh, the Ag Commissioner, Ron Ross. And uh, um, Ron, would you like uh, I want to hear about the uh, West Nile virus and, and the, uh, I guess you had a dead bird or something out in Shore Road. I think the public needs to be aware of that. Good morning, Mr. Board and uh, members <coughs> of the uh, other board supervisors. Yeah, last Monday it was confirmed that there was a uh, horse that was found positive for West Nile virus in the North County area, specifically in the Lover's Lane area. This um, 
Um, West Nile virus is a potentially serious disease that's transmitted by mosquito bites. And um, horses are susceptible to it as, long as, as well as humans. Um, <clears throat> the, it's important to, to note this because this is the first time we've had West Nile virus appear in the county since 2006. Um, what we're doing presently is we're doing some extensive trapping that area to see if there are mosquitoes up there that are harboring West Nile virus that can spread it to people, and then we'll, we'll do an appropriate action. But for the time being, <clears throat> what we're doing is we're encouraging people to check their backyards, make sure that they're dumping um, any water that's uh, uh, such as dog bowls, uh, water fountains, bird baths, th things that might accumulate water to make sure that they're drained because those serve as sources for mosquito larvae. Um, if they go out in the evening, make sure they wear <coughs> long sleeve clothing, um, um, long leg clothing, uh, mosquito repellent. Just take some basic precautions to uh, protect themselves. Now it's Supervisor Munzer. Uh, Ron, do the horse, horse owners themselves, do they need, I mean, not personally, but for their, for their livestock, do they need to take any additional precautions? Uh, yeah, there is a vaccine that's available for horses. Unfortunately, there's not one available for humans, but there is one available for horses, and it's very effective. It, they recommend to, to get that once a year. Unfortunately, this horse didn't have the vaccine and had to be euthanized. So, okay, so, so basically you're encouraging all ho horse owners to make sure they're Yeah, make sure that they're are, vaccinated are vaccine. and, okay, and they keep those you. vaccinations up. Okay, uh, Supervisor Barrios. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ron, what were the signs of um, that this horse had West Nile virus? What were the symptoms? Um, well, when horses get West Nile virus, they become very lethargic, they're slow, they're, they can't move very well. West Nile virus affects the nervous system so that they, 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 they show symptoms of just not being very active and so forth. So it just kind of stand around, won't want to move. So that's the symptoms of West Nile virus. And, and unfortunately, there's not a cure for it for horses or for humans either. It's a virus and uh, there's, a, there's a vaccination to prevent it from happening or to prevent it from contacting it. But once you've had it, there's, there's, not, uh, there's not a cure for it. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? All right. Uh, we'll move on to uh, uh, board announcements. Uh, Supervisor De La Cruz? <coughs> Done, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. Um, Supervisor Barrios? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I attended the RCRC meeting, and I'm happy to say that uh, it was very well attended. They had a lot of really wonderful information for rural counties. And uh, I'm sorry that you couldn't be there, but I know that I went on your behalf because you're usually very good about attending these meetings. We had representatives there from State Board of Equalization who are still very concerned about that fire, the SRA fee. Yeah. And they're saying that we still need to fight the fight. It isn't over. Even though we're paying the fee, they're still working on our behalf to try to get that resolved so that we don't have that excessive cost to property owners. They think it's unfair. They also talked about broadband and how they are promoting broadband for rural counties. We need it for public safety, and uh, it's important that we continue the fight to make sure that we get funding for broadband in the rural counties. They talked about overregulation, which is an issue, uh, overregulation in rural counties who don't have the resources as big cities and other areas uh, do. Uh, they talked about medical marijuana and how hard it is to uh, we need to uh, make sure that we let them know because it's very hard to monitor because it's a cash business. But once they know about it, they know how to pursue it and how to get money and tax them. So I think that that's important for rural counties where it's happening uh, more than in the uh, cities. Uh, they said they will go after them. Uh, it's not fair the way that it's being done. And so they will not go away unless we make a very serious effort to make sure that we let the state board know where they are. Uh, some of the legislation that is uh, sitting before the governor is expected to be signed by October the 13th. And the legislation that is going to affect San Benito County is, um, has to deal with publication actions um, uh, and uh, uh, Ralph Brown Act um, legislation where we have to not only re make sure that we conduct our business publicly, but when there is a closed session decision, we have to publicly let uh, the public know how everybody voted. So that's something new that has not been done in the past. 
Uh, they are also talking about, oh, one of the biggest issues was the rim fire. The rim fire, um, it is, um, the, our forests are over-regulated by the federal government, and they wanted to express how it has a very bad effect on rural counties because it affects our watershed. And they, uh, their hands are tied. They lose a lot of they, uh, their resources. They lose a lot of tourism. They have a lot of economic setbacks. And they want to make sure that we help in writing letters to Washington to, to allow us to be able to regulate, allow counties. And I know that San Benito County has not been affected by tremendous fires like other counties. But nonetheless, we get affected by the way it affects the economy in the state of California and the way it affects our watersheds. So they want us to continue to fight the fight to make sure that they know that we want to be able to regulate. There's, uh, they, they are blaming the fires on their fuel fires, mm -hmm. and um, uh, the Washington just doesn't get it. And so, um, so anyway, I want to make sure that we are aware of that, and if there's anything that we can do, and I'll direct that to our CAO, any letters, any, any um, kind of communication that we can do, I'd like to uh, make sure that we encourage that. So anything else in legislation if that affects San Diego County that I feel is important, I will report on it on October the 15th. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Barrios. Supervisor Lanza, or anything? Okay. All right. Uh, we'll move on to a consent agenda. Any uh, board members have any to pull? Um, M okay. Mr. Chair, I'd like to pull 13 out. Which one? 13. 13. Okay. Uh, any other items, uh, supervisors? If not, uh, does the public wish to pull any of the items on the consent agenda? Seeing none from the pub, uh, number six. All right. And I'm sorry. Number 20 is on a regular agenda, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, that's regular agenda. Okay, so I have item 6 and 13 to be pulled and item 15 to be continued. I'll move approval. Uh, I'll move up um, board approval of the, uh, re the remainder of the consent calendar, Mr. Chair. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, hearing none. Uh, item six was pulled by the public. Um, Mr. Jones, did you want to step forward and a um, ask a question about item six? First? Yeah, you're first. Congratulations. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Clerk of the Board. Lethargic. Hello, David. Let him come first. Yeah, come ahead, David. All right. I'm sorry. Mr. You're Jones. You're out to go second, uh, Mr. Jones. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which I hoping to have a rebuttal for Marvin. But good morning, uh, good. Supervisors. David Hugh from Hollister. Good morning. Um, good morning, yes. And um, not only am I an architect, but I'm also a chairman of the Green Business Committee with the San Benito County Chamber of Commerce. And this uh, CCAs has been on our agenda for quite some time now. And it's been very intriguing. I'll be very brief. Um, the acronym CCA. I think the key word is choice. This is a feasibility study to see if this will work for our community. The opportunity to me is very intriguing. It gives us a choice as a citizen, and it gives you a choice to decide where our power comes from. When we have that choice to decide where the power comes from, then there's creative things that we can do as a community with the revenue in terms of job creation, green jobs, and all underlying the whole CCA is AB 32, which, as you know, we're mandated to de decrease our carbon footprint. So. I think that this is a, a tremendous opportunity, has a, has a great upside. The Marin County has already adopted a CCA. They, it's the Marin County uh, Energy Authority. They have, as their last fiscal year, have serviced their debt, startup costs, um, paid that back. 
uh, and have generated a $5 million surplus. So, and also have increased their portfolio of renewable energy from 20 percent to 50 percent. So I think that the upside on this is, is tremendous and I, I, I'm happy to see it on the agenda and I really urge your support of it to go forward with the feasibility study. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Marvin Jones. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Board, Marvin Jones, Hollister. Read the first opening sentence on your agenda transmission area there, a uh, document. Community Choice Aggregation, CCA, is a program through which local governments assume responsibility for providing electrical power to residents and commercial customers within their jurisdiction in partnership with PG&E. Got another government body going to get in the, in the way here. Uh, it's, that's private public partnership comes right out of Agenda 21. Let's get uh, get another layer of government in, con in control. Uh, we'll have government control over another part of private enterprise. A uh, number of times we found that in the dictionary. It always comes up at the same place. You remember what it is? Government control over private enterprise? Fascism. You know, we had the dictionary down here and that's where we found it. We got lots of regional governments. We've got AMBAG. Did any of y'all read that 2011 um, AMBAG document, the vision for the Monterey Bay area? Whoo, that's frightening. You can't even hardly go to the bathroom without their permission. We've got COG. We've got Monterey Bay Air Quality Board. According to your general plan, you're abdicating your responsibility if we ever have a, a enterprise in San Benito County that wants to do business, wants to do some economic development, two places in your general plan you say you will defer to them after you've done all of your stuff. We do not need another government layer over private enterprise, and I think you ought to think twice before you enter into this agreement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Anyone uh, else from the public would like to speak on this? Not, uh, Mr. Chair. Oh, you got it. Um, so we have um, actually uh, Santa Cruz County representation here, um, Jenny Johnson. She's from the uh, Supervisor McPherson's office. And uh, we also have Margie Riappel here as well to um, kind of explain a little bit more about the program and about the feasibility I of the community choice aggregation. So if okay. you. I, I think uh, the public would appreciate uh, a little bit further detailed explanation. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, this morning we're here to, t to look at an opportunity to get involved with the feasibility study to look at a CCA process if it's feasible for us in our county. Santa Cruz County and Monterey County are already exploring that option and they've already raised funds to pay for the feasibility study. They've kindly asked us to participate in the study uh, with no obligation of cost. Um, it's an opportunity for us to do a fe feasibility study about a CCA here um, um, when other counties are already pursuing this, this uh, CCA process. Many counties and cities are already in the process of, of um, developing their own feasibility studies and Marin County and San Luis Obispo have been successful. So. Um, we have Jenny Johnson here today who can speak to you in more depth about a CCA and how it all came about. Um, there are some flyers that are back at the station and uh, we have some for the Board of Supervisors as well. And so um, I hope you'll give her an opportunity to speak on this matter. Um, again, that's Jenny Johnson. She's with Supervisor McPherson's office in Santa Cruz County. Good morning, Mr. Chair and, and Supervisors, members of the Board. Really appreciate this opportunity and I will keep it really brief. Um, this opportunity is for the County of San Benito to explore in partnership with other regional governments whether or not community choice aggregation is an appropriate choice for our region. There's no obligation to the County um, financially, nor is there an obligation to move forward with a Joint Powers Authority um, if after the feasibility study is done. There's basically, it's just giving you choices to discuss for the future. 
Um, there are ma major economic and environmental benefits to and why we want to explore CCA. Marine Energy Authority, Marine Energy County has actually done this in partnership in the last three years with PG&E. They've done it very successfully. It has not been a taxpayer supported initiative. It's been supported by electricity rate payers. They've been able to um, re maintain electricity rates on rate parity with PG&E and Marin, um, pay down their startup debt with interest and bank um, additional surplus dollars to do uh, re local renewable energy projects which have created local jobs and they'll continue to do that. So what's exciting is they just put up their first large solar um, uh, installation, not as big as the one you have here of course um, going up, but um, enough for 300 homes at their airport which again created local jobs. So that's really, those are the economic reasons to um, explore the feasibility. The environmental reasons are also very good. 40% of our greenhouse gas does come from the built environment and that's our energy consumption. So if we're able to produce that energy, procure it and produce it a little bit more green, then that's good for our greenhouse gas emissions. But the economic benefits to um, our entire region are um, very, very profound and we want to um, really find out whether or not this is going to be appropriate. Um, you all know Bruce McPherson. He's been around for many years. And when he decided to run for local office and he came and asked me um, in my retirement, <laughs> one of those people that came back from retirement, um, if I would come and do policy work with him, I said I would be not only privileged but thrilled to do it. But I was working on this little project called CCA and he might want to know about it. And not only did he like it, but he championed it with the Board of Supervisors, with the county of Santa Cruz and Monterey County and all of our cities in Santa Cruz uh, for the cities in Monterey County and now we're before you. You are a very important county to this effort because if this is feasible, this is the place where we probably have the most hope of building local uh, renewable energy projects and, and creating local jobs. And that's really important to you. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have and I really encourage you to um, approve this exploration. Uh, any, any questions for the board? I have one, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming in and presenting to us. It, it, this talks about uh, partnerships with uh, cities. Is the city of Hollister then would be, uh, we, we, we would do this together as partners to try to, uh, to make, save money? Right, right. So what we want to do is we haven't heard from the city of Hollister yet, but we hope that both of your city councils will be wanting to pass similar resolutions and participate, again, with no general fund impacts to them. Um, because um, uh, the way the state legislation, the CCA state legislation was written, local governments have to approve whether or not they participate in, in, in these studies. And so we're hoping that Hollister and San Juan Batista would both be um, our partners. Again, we have all four cities within Santa Cruz County, our county, four of the uh, 11 cities in Monterey so far. We probably have two more soon. And we hope that your two cities will also join. So we'll be approaching them. Okay, so then this, uh, group is going to come together collectively then yes. as a regional yes. uh, means of providing savings and coming up with innovative ways of uh, well, we're doing a study. So what we will do, the end result will be, we've got, we're in the process really of raising the funds for the study. We don't have all the funds raised, but we're, we're in process. Okay, so the study will come first and then. Right, and we'll what? be coming before, back before your boards if you approve this item, okay. saying here's what the study shows, the economic impacts, the um, environmental impacts. Here's how we would start it up. Here's the entire business plan. So you would have all the information to have a real thoughtful discussion okay. about what you wanted to do. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. Um, Again, Mr. Supervisor Chair. David Cruz. Thank you. Um, this is a regional uh, effort, right? Correct. Yes. Um, would it ever come down to the point where there be sacrifices be made for one local jurisdiction over the other jurisdiction, for the interest of the global uh, regional perspective? What I mean is, this, mm -hmm. will you basically dump all the solar panels in San Bernardino County, so then all the jobs and all the benefits will go to a different area? Yeah, no, um, that's actually not how it works because you have to think about how the grid works. The way the grid works and because we have an investor in utility that would continue to own that grid, maintain that grid, do all the customer service, et cetera, um, any kind of renewable energy that we create in the region feeds the grid. 
And so um, basically, it, you really have to think in terms of sort of the 50,000 foot regional level, and what's best for the region, because the more that we can generate regionally, wherever it is, the better for the entire region. So I can't imagine that happening. And moreover, if there was a joint powers authority agency that was formed after your due diligence and you have all the information, San, Juan, uh, your, San Benito County would be represented, as would your cities. And so you would have the opportunity to say, I like that, I don't like that, and so would the public. So um, the way it's worked in Marin uh, Energy Authority, they've got all their cities, their county and the city of Richmond. It hasn't worked that way in reality, and they've been providing electricity for three years. It's been the more the merrier. So you, you'll go through the whole process just like any the whole process. company where you apply for the tax credits, you'll submit an application to pg and &E for purchase agreement and all the other all the other things that are required. All of that, that will all be analyzed. At the end, unfortunately, it'll be a 200-page document that you and your staff will have to, um, to look at. But there will be all the information you'll need to say, yeah, this sounds like a good thing or not. Yeah, all thank right, you. Thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, Supervisor Munzer. I, just a comment. I want to thank uh, the County of Santa Cruz and, and especially Supervisor McPherson for for asking us to participate in this as the representative of this board on two of those um, regional organizations that were were mentioned earlier I, I realize the importance that it is for us to be a player in the region um, San Diego County has long considered itself an island that could take care of itself and just be off the beaten path I don't think that's that's feasible anymore. We need to be at the table. We need to know what the counties that surround us are doing, and we need to participate. So I fully support this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, with that, I'm, I'll allow the public to um, step forward. Uh, if there's any further questions or comments, it would be fine. Thank you very much. That helped. Sorry, I wanted to get in before your presentation, but I guess I, I should have waved my hand. Marty Richmond from Hollister. Uh, somebody famous once said, I don't know of anything so dangerous that we can't talk about it. And I don't think this is so dangerous that we can't talk about it, get a study on it. So I'm going to support this. Uh, it, isn't, it isn't often that I, 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 I disagree with my, my really good friend, Mr. Jones, Dr. Jones, but I, I will in this case because uh, unlike, unlike the City Council of Hollister's attitude toward consolidation of the, of the public safety, uh, we can talk about anything we want to talk about if we're adult about it and we're willing to look at the facts. So I'm not drawing any pre-notions. Pre I don't know how it's going to come out. I would, I would caution you, though, on a few things. So I support the study because we should do it and we should know the answers. But I want to question you on the old thing of let's everybody get on board. We've been had that way. We have, we have peculiar problems. And I certainly don't want us to be an island uh, unto ourselves. But we have specific problems that run around economics. And often what people with in much better economic condition than we are, be it Marin or or Santa Cruz or Monterey, Northern Monterey, which is a separate county from Southern Monterey, have, uh, we can't afford to do it. So one of the important things here would be to say what is the real economic impact, immediate impact, not the long-range impact because we have immediate problems, and I hope you will look at that. So I'm willing to support it, certainly, and hope that the cost of the energy comes in in a very short while uh, equal or below that for PG&E. One of the reasons I disagree with my good friend, Mr. Jones, is that I don't consider PG&E to be a private company. That's right. Okay, <laughs> they're basically, <laughs> BU, the PUC owns them lock, stock, and barrel, and I have no choice. When I turn my electricity on, it comes from the only place I can buy it, which is, you know, they might as well be part of the state government the way it works right now, PG&E. I mean, the only fight they ever have with the PUC is who's going to rape the rate payers more, okay? And I always thought that uh, having more than one source for where to buy uh, your books 
your clothing, your computers, or your electricity eventually drives the price down due to competition. Competition is good. It is the mainstay of American uh, capitalism, uh, better products at a lower price. And uh, like I like to, like someone said the other day, and I'll wrap up concerning the fracking uh, thing down at uh, Pinnacles. Uh, do you want to frack or you want to send your kid to Iraq? We're either going to get our own energy or we're going to be in a lot of trouble. So I support this. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else? Good morning, Chairman Battello, Supervisors. My name is Christina Chavez-White. I'm a resident, resident of San Benito County. And I just wanted to let you know, in case it's not publicly known, and I didn't see it in the staff report, that I believe that this interest and the pro lead proponent of bringing community choice aggregation to San Benito County is actually the San Benito County Chamber of Commerce and Visitors Bureau. We first approached, approached staff in March and have sent, had formal board action and support that was brought forth through our Green Business Committee and also through our Government Relations Committee to request that the county explore this opportunity. And in the event that county doesn't have staff resources, if Margie can't spend her time, that we would, we would like to nominate D David Huboy to be representative of our community in the event that you don't have staff allocation or resources to continue moving forward. Thank you for your support of this effort. Thank you very much, Ms. Wyatt. Anybody else? Please step forward. Good morning. Uh, Chris Kahn, for, uh, President of Joint Venture Monterey Bay. And uh, I just uh, want to bring this back to something this is really something very simple. This is probably the easiest ask uh, that you'll have before you. Um, today's action is only to join a study that is going on, whether you join it or not. It's already funded by the other uh, participants, or will be. And um, the result of this is just to provide San Benito County the information that it would need to look at uh, at the potential of a CCA and see if it's something that you do or don't want to join in with. Um, if at a future date, if you were not to uh, join the, the feasibility study today and then uh, the CCA were to be formed and then at a future date you look and, and would like to consider participating, you would then have to go through another feasibility study and come up for the funding on your own to do that. So. Uh, so uh, once again, yes, I think this is just uh, a good opportunity for you to collect information uh, to make a future decision. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Anybody else from public? If not, I'll close the public comment uh, period and uh, bring it back to the board for uh, uh, Mr. Chair, comments. I'll move uh, adoption of a resolution number 2013-70 um, for uh, the consent item number six. Okay. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, <coughs> hearing none. We'll move on to item 13. Um, um, there are two other actions that need to take place um, uh, with this item. I'm sorry. Um, we need to direct the um, CAO uh, or interim to designate one staff person and an alternate to participate. It encompass the whole item. Yeah, I, I think uh, the uh, motion carried the, the full item and oh, direction. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't staff. hear you say that. Recommendation. Thank you, Margie. Um, we'll go on to item 13. Yeah, Mr. Supervisor Chair. Supervisor De La Cruz. Thank you. Uh, Mar Maria Enrique. I just have two very simple questions. Uh, Enrique, mm -hmm. the, the collections of the rental that, that, the, um, <coughs> that, the, that the program generates, does that go directly to back to the state of California? Yes, it does. It does. Uh, directly okay. back to the state. Okay. And then the other question, I, I was watching at the, oh, sorry, I was reviewing the budget, and it seems like it's consistent, the same one budget, at, at one year after the other, the same budget in terms of salaries, expenses, and everything. Is that just, a, is that a standard template type of budget that you work within? If there's any unders or over, you just move them around, the line items? Um, that is the case in the event of this budget. This is a two-year budget, the first time OMS has uh, gone through this process. 
when we submitted our budgets, we did submit two different budgets for this year and next year. They came back with the same budget, but what they did is for year one, they overestimated the expenditures with whatever carried over to be used for next year. Okay. And that's that's why the two budgets okay, are the so same. So it doesn't show a reflection or, or an increase or a decrease in, in no. payroll or benefits or anything like that? No, and for us for this year, our budget is less because the uh, migrant center manager position has been vacant. So they did budget uh, like, like a full year with whatever carried over to be used for any, to offset any additional cost for next year. Okay, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any Thank you. other questions? Supervisor Barros. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Enrique, the um, personnel salaries or wages, is it for one person or several people? How many people are in that amount? There are three staff, the manager, okay. and for year one, again, reflects uh, nine month, eight or nine month budget because we don't have that position open, of, uh, an office assistant and a maintenance uh, groundskeeper. Okay, good. I, I, there was no detail on that mm -hmm. and it just had a total amount, so yeah. just checking on that. Thank you so okay. much. Thank sure. you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Munzer. Thank you. Uh, Enrique, is this facility also used for a homeless um, shelter in the winter? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. This is the uh, uh, migrant, San Pedro County Migrant Center has the cabins for migrant farm seasonal families. Right. Uh, our department operates them, and during the winter months, we request to the state to use 20 to 25 uh, cabins for homeless families, okay. and our department operates Okay, them. so where I was going with this was we do have permission from the state to use it as a homeless shelter in the winter. Correct. Every year I submit a written request and get a response from the state. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I Actually, Mr. Chair, um, two things. Uh, indicate uh, who pays for the expenditures during that, that time? We have a grant from the Community Services Block Grant, CSBG. Okay. Uh, and we use those funds to pay all expenditures, uh, and we've been doing that for years. Okay. And can you do me, can you do me a favor, and not right now, later on, even tomorrow, can you provide me with uh, last year's budget expenditure detail? For the? For the for six months, for the in-season uh, budget? For the labor camp? Uh, I, I don't understand for which period of time, for what? For the uh, homeless winter shelter program? No, okay. no for the just regular migrant uh, <coughs> center. Oh, operation. for last year's? Yes. Okay, correct. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions, comments from the board? If not, uh, any questions, comments from the public? Seeing none, I'll bring it back. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to adopt resolution 2013 72. 72, approving the operations maintenance contracts 13 0. OMS-968 between the State Department of Housing and Community Development and County Assembly on the amount of 791430 and authorized board chair to sign said resolution and authorize the HHSA interim director or designee to be, be the signature authority for said contract and needs to control amendments to said contract. Second. All those favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. Thank you. We'll move on to our regular agenda. Um, item 19. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, this uh, is going to be presented to us by Ron Ross. He's our Ag Commissioner. And the uh, topic's going to be uh, about accepting a donation. It's kind of a, a good deed here uh, for painting the racist building on Southside Road uh, by the Bo Boy Scouts. So we have uh, Ron Ross here to talk about that. Thanks, Ron Ross. Good morning again, Board. Um, I'm here to discuss a, a pending Eagle Scout project that pertains to painting a county building. Uh, Eagle Scout is the highest ranked as obtainable in the Boy Scout program, and since its uh, introduction in uh, 1911, uh, this rank has been earned by more than uh, two million scouts. Some of the prominent Eagle Scouts that uh, include uh, New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg, uh, astronaut Neil Armstrong, um, past President Gerald Ford, and uh, Steven Spielberg was actually a voice, uh, an Eagle Scout too. However, uh, only uh, four out of every hundred boys that join Boy Scouts actually will make the rank of Eagle. Uh, one of the requirements for um, the Eagle Award calls for the Scout to plan, develop, and lead a service project. And this is, the, this is called the Eagle Project that demonstrates both leadership and a commitment to duty. Uh, we have a local Scout, Miles Franklin, who is a member of Troop 777, who is a candidate for Eagle Scout. 
Um, his service project, Miles proposing to paint one of the county buildings at the Southside Road complex. Um, this building is used by the Samuel County Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Services, or RACES, for their office and equipment storage. Uh, the RACES is a county organization that uh, falls under the county's Office of Emergency Services, and the RACES group consists of amateur radio operators who are registered uh, disaster service workers for the county and uh, will provide the county with auxiliary communications when needed. Uh, Miles Franklin has prepared the plan as presented uh, that to the local scout council and it has been approved. Uh, Miles is gonna be responsible for all phases of the Eagle project, including um, obtaining materials, um, getting the proper equipment and overseeing the labor to, uh, to, to paint the building. Uh, Miles is gonna be um, mentored by John Starkweather, who's a local painting contractor. Um, this, this service project is, would require your, your board's approval. And unfortunately, Miles is gonna come today, but because of he's in school and he has a commitment, he was, was not able to make it, but I do have um, one of the local scout leaders here in case there's any questions. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? Just a comment, Mr. Chair, that I that I really support this. I think it's wonderful that we support young people and the good things that they're doing for the community, and so I will certainly support it. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other comments from the board? I I, I know I've been to um, a couple of Eagle Scout ceremonies in my district, and uh, it's really heartening to see you know young men. Uh, achieving that that rank in the uh, Boy Scout uh, uh, organization and uh, anything that you know the county can do to help in that those efforts is, is fantastic and I hope when we have the project completed if we come back and uh, give a you know some sort of certificate of recognition from the board it, it would be very appropriate and uh, I'm excited about this any comments from the public? If not, uh, I'll bring it back to the board. I'll make a motion to accept the donation of painting the racist building at 3224 Southside Road by Troop 777, Boy Scouts of America, and authorize the Agricultural Commis Commissioner execute any documents required subject to review by the County Council and the Interim County uh, CAO. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, hearing none. I'm going to move item 20 to the end and go on to item 21. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Is there a reason to move item 20? Yeah, I'm going to move item 20 to uh, behind yeah, but what, 23. But what is the reason? Um, I'd like I, to hear item 20 because I believe there's people in the audience that are waiting for item 20. Well, that's there, it's probably a recover, uh, require some discussion, and I would like to, you know, not utilize too much of the time of the Trindale um, representative that's here. Well, can we just move to item 20 uh, to go after 21? Pardon so me? Can we just swap 20 and 21? Okay, I'll do that, sure. Um, yeah, I, I just want to hear from the Trindale uh, representative. If he's not here. He's not here. So. Oh, jeez. I made a big deal <laughs> about nothing then. <laughs> right, so one minute, Mr. Chair. Okay. That's embarrassing. <laughs> Why don't we take a five-minute break? That would be a good idea. I didn't make an effort if I should have. My fault. But yes, I did move things, but I didn't. I ran out of time. So this is what I did. I won baskets and different things that I had.
That's okay. We're good. I got to find the town council on. I'm good. They went quick. Pardon? They went quick. I was thinking, oh, it'll be a couple hours. Yeah, the consent was a large Is it not reading your? No, it's already going. Oh, okay. Nobody knows that yet, but it's it's working. That might have been part of the problem. Make sure that's plugged in. This been the but yeah, I'm ready to go whenever anybody else is. Here of all my thirteen years? Was it thirteen years? No. Ten years? Nine years? Yeah. And I think we're gonna have a Yeah, I just put it back in and took it out, rebooted it. Okay. Start reading it so. okay, I'll call back the meeting back to order and, and welcome uh, David Nelson from Trindell. Comes from all the way from uh, Trinity County. That's correct. Yeah, that's why, you know, I thought maybe get you moved up a little bit and so you could make your presentation and you could have the long beautiful drive back home <laughs> I appreciate it um, I'm pleased to be here uh, board members uh, chairman my name is David Nelson I'm the executive director of Trindell Insurance Fund and uh, I'm here today basically to give a, a brief uh, review for for those of you that have been on the board for a while and for the new board members just a, a orientation of what is Trindell and where we're kind of headed in the future to give you an idea of what we're doing for you. Um, so without any further ado, I'll just roll through here. Um, Trindell was established in 1980. It's a public uh, entity joint powers authority for risk pooling, in, uh, risk insurance pooling. <clears throat> it provides members with the most cost-effective risk financing mechanisms for selected property, casualty, workers' comp, liability, and other coverages. Uh, our goal is to manage these programs to ensure fiscal soundness, superior service, stability of cost, effective loss prevention, and education programs to benefit and meet the public, the employees, and the county's needs. Um, our organizational chart looks like this, our board of directors are who gives us um, all of our direction. Uh, you can see next is the executive director, which is myself. We have administrative uh, secretary that helps me with with uh, the day-to-day -day stuff, and then we have three departments, uh, which I like to to name: liability, property, uh, loss prevention, and workers' comp claims handling. Uh, the liability property, you can see that branch is in circles. That's just to demonstrate that that's a contracted service. We don't have anybody on staff for, the, for that. We contract with George Hill's company, and those, that's the firm that helps us uh, manage your tort claim, your liability type uh, cases. So we work through a contract on, on, on those services. The other service is uh, the loss prevention services. We have two employees that visits all 10 counties throughout the year. To, help everybody stay on track with avoiding uh, 
un unnecessary costs. And then we have the director of, uh, director of Workers Compensation, which is a new uh, program for us. Uh, but we have uh, three adjusters in there, and we'll cover that a little bit later. Okay, so why Trendell? What is unique? Uh, what's unique about Trendell as far as insurance pooling goes and JPAs is that we're all made up of rural counties. Uh, similar to yourself, we're all rural counties. We all have the same type needs and, and, and struggles and, and, and things that, that are unique to, to rural counties. We're member driven. That's a, a unique thing with our JPA. Every county that is a member with Trendell sits on the board and helps direct that. Uh, we're a banking arrangement and that's a little bit different than probably 99% of the other insurance pools in California in that we don't share risk with your other rural counties that you're in the JPA with. Um, so we're not pooling risk with other entities. Your risk is your own. And we'll explain that a little bit later. Uh, the best risk financing scenarios for rural counties. Um, there's, there's a lot of thought process that goes into this. It's what I spend a majority of my time on doing is finding what the best mix is of self-insuring and buying insurance and excess layers and reinsurance. And where the best um, combination of that is to save you money. So we're constantly evaluating that year to year. We have an outstanding uh, loss prevention program, which I believe is leading the industry in California right now, and superior claims handling. So uh, under rural county membership, you can see the, uh, behind me here the, the counties that are involved with Trendell. Uh, we, we have 10 counties, rural counties, and uh, right now the JPA and the, the members have said they're not looking for new membership. Um, we're not turning anybody away if they were to ask for help, but right now um, we feel we're at a, a optimum operating size and things are working out well. Uh, we got similar demographics, similar needs for fiscal issues and uh, claims venues. And that's something that I think is, is, shouldn't be looked at too lightly because as you know as a small county, whenever there's a federal or state change in the funding mechanisms for your departments, it hits you uniquely, uh, not like a large county where they can absorb a lot of those changes. But a small percentage decrease or increase in revenue changes your business significantly. So we sit around the table and talk about those and, and uh, see what we can do to help out from the insurance perspective. Remember driven, this is just a, a picture of uh, one of our, our board meetings and there's representation from every county there to direct the organization where they think it's appropriate to go. Um, anybody that's here is invited to attend these meetings. They're open meetings just like this one and we encourage that. Um, we, as you know, you recently uh, appointed Mr. Gonzalez and Mrs. Norris as our board member and alternate for our, mm -hmm. to represent you at this table. Um, and there's, there's a lot of decisions that go on that will impact your county um, going forward, as you know, um, from past experience. There is uh, another JPA that we work very closely together with when that's CSAC EIA, that's an EIA stands for Excess Insurance Authority. So we insure your primary la layers with Trendell. When we get to excess, we typically go through uh, EIA to purchase um, the excess coverages for if you had any catastrophic type losses. Um, so the appointments on that board is something that probably ought to be brought to you in probably in the next meeting or two to, to appoint um, uh, someone to sit on those committees as well. Um, they, they go hand in hand. Um, the banking arrangement, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. The banking arrangement, as I said, is very unique for Trindell. So when you send premiums out to cover your losses, they come to Trindell and they're held separately from everybody else's funds. And then when you have a loss, whether it be workers' comp, liability, um, pollution, malpractice, any of those types of costs come in, we pay it out of your funds. And so it's, it's dollar for dollar and we hope that we manage it through our loss prevention program and at the end of the year that there's money left over there for you. It's not like just buying insurance. When you buy insurance, you pay it and it's gone, regardless how well you perform. We're very well, uh, much based on performance. So we, 
we emphasize a loss prevention program. If we perform better than the average counties, we will be making money for you. And we are continually um, hitting those marks year after year. That's what's made us so successful. So the, the takeaway here is basically every member county has funds within Trendell and it's not commingled. The second takeaway is Trendell has no assets as an organization. We work for you directly. Um, there's no cash balance, there's no assets around. Everything that is Trendell belongs to you, the members, and it's divided up evenly amongst the 10 members. So there's no other incentive for us. We're basically public employees working. We have a vested interest that you guys do well. There's no other motives there, and that's really unique to our JPA, because most JPAs have a fund balance, have assets, and they're working for some other strategy in their, in, for their own interest. So I think that's very unique in, in our regard, and it helps us outperform most of them, if not all. This slide is very small. I know you can't read it, um, but I just threw it up there for representation. What I want to take away from this slide is that each one of those towers that you see represents a different line of insurance that we, we uh, purchase for you guys. Everything from workers' comp um, to bond and crime, airport, uh, pollution, property uh, damage, all the different uh, policies that we have. When I talk about risk financing options, I touched on a little bit earlier, where is the best mix where we self-insure and then we buy excess? We can self-insure at a lower level, let's say 100,000, um, and then buy more insurance or insurance higher and self-insure higher and buy less uh, catastrophic insurance. Those mixes change every year depending on what the insurance market's doing. So if we're in a soft market, um, we'd be buying more insurance because it's going to be cheaper for us. If we're in a hard market like we are today, we're moving to a more self-insured environment, which most uh, all the public entities in California are, are scrambling to get to a more self-insured position. Um, the nice thing about Trendell is the smaller entities typically don't have the extra capital to try to self-insure themselves, but as a group, we allow you guys to be able to step into that self-insurance world without putting up a lot of capital because we, we move as a group. So that's an advantage uh, for us. So as everybody else is scrambling to get there, we've, we've already made those adjustments uh, two and three years ago because um, we're looking at it continuously. Our, our workers' comp, the f tower on the far left, um, a walk through that, you see the bottom layer, the really dark layer, it says it's a zero deductible. That's the workers' comp column. The next section above that is the self-insured section. That's from $1 to $300,000. The next section is the next, next layer of insurance is the EIA, the Excess Insurance Authority's pool layer. And then beyond that, we buy, and that's up to $5 million. And then beyond that, we buy catastrophic insurance or excess insurance up to, uh, I don't know the limits on that. I think it's somewhere around 25 million or statutory limit, basically. Because in the state of California, you're liable no matter how much it costs. So we ensure, no matter what it goes to, that you'll be covered for those losses. So it's, it's insured all the way to the statutory limit. So those layers are important to us in how, where we attach the next layer and when, where, what's the most cost effective operation for the upcoming years. Um, something we spend a lot of time at at our board meetings discussing what, what would be the best option going forward. Our outstanding loss prevention program. Um, we have people on the, f uh, you know, feet in, in the counties doing real work in each one of your member counties. Um, and we're, we're giving safety trainings. So one picture is, I believe, up in Modoc. They're giving forklift training in the snow. Uh, the, the, gra or the picture on the right is a classroom training. I believe that's in Calusa County. Um, but it's just, it shows you, you know, basically we're out there doing this. This is what we do in every county. Um, we have leadership trainings to make, sh to try to help your, your supervisors and managers make the right decisions, stay out of liability stuff. We have safety trainings and safety materials um, 
uh, that we bring to your county through our website and through visiting to help uh, reduce the workers' comp costs that, that we incur. And uh, we really are on the leading edge of this. Um, I, I don't have not met an, another JPA entity that that puts as much emphasis on this part of it. Um, and I think that is the real reason why we have been so successful for the last 30 plus years, is that there's a real emphasis on the safety. And in the long run, you're saving money because of it. You know, change a safety culture within an organization, um, it, makes, it makes a huge difference in the long run. Superior claims handling, I wanna to touch on this a little bit. Uh, two years ago, the board decided that it would be um, the best option to um, bring claims in-house. In other words, we, we fired our TPA and we brought in uh, employees into Trindell to manage your workers' comp claims uh, for two reasons. One I brought up before that other entities have another motivating factor. Um, they're not, they don't have as much ownership with your claims as your own employees would because they have a profit margin they have to hit, they have to, um, you know, their, their ultimate boss is somebody else, some other organization. So they thought bringing that in-house would, would take out the, those different incentives that weren't really helping you and target more of the, the resources to exactly how you wanted to manage your claims. So we've brought uh, three adjusters in-house in and we're a little bit, I think we're about 15 or 16 months into that right now. It's going very well. Um, we had some startup struggles like every business does, but I will tell you that we are operating at a very high level now and we will continue to get better. It has been one of the best decisions uh, the board has made over the last 15 plus years, I believe, in, and uh, you're gonna see a lot of benefits from that going forward. Not only are we getting more personalized uh, service now for, for our injured workers and getting them back to work earlier, quicker, it's costing us less. And that's the bottom line. Um, that's what most of our meetings are about is how can we get this done cheaper, you know, in the, the current climate that every, all our, our members are in. So just to recap, um, we're a public JPA. We're comprised of rural counties. Uh, we're member driven. It's a banking arrangement, not a pool. And we have the best risk financing scenarios. We're reviewing those all the time. We have our outstanding loss prevention program and superior claim service handling. So that kind of ends the kind of overview of what is Trindell. Um, oh, can be open for any uh, questions uh, if you have any. I have a few more slides that kind of put in perspective um, costs amongst the members. I can go through those unless you have questions about anything? Uh, any questions from the board? Um, if not, uh, any questions from the public? If not, uh, Joe Paul, you want to add anything or since you represent us up there? <laughs> <laughs> well, I this, this, this was my first meeting. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, but you know, it was a <clears throat> very, uh, very enlightening meeting that we just attended in, in Portola, which is in Plumas County. Um, I was um, impressed with the level of commitment to uh, loss prevention, because uh, one of the items on the agenda was, was to look at, hey, are, are we interested in, in adding other, other counties to the, to the JPA? And there was another county that was uh, on the agenda to we talked about but uh, ultimately the board decided, no, we're not gonna pursue uh, having uh, uh, this other county uh, be part of the JPA because the culture of loss prevention isn't at the same level as the Trindell counties. And this is what makes you know, Trindell kind of unique and uh, has indeed kept our costs pretty low. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Mr. Chair. Think, Mr. Chair. Supervisor Dave Cruz. Uh, maybe Joe can answer this question. Uh, is there actually dollars transferred to Trindell's holding account or per se? Yeah, they actually hold the, the county's uh, deposit. Uh, that's, you know, that's held there uh, as a, you know, separately, but in a pool. Because I see that uh, it's all about uh, risk asset allocation 
at a minimum, which means you're assuming very little rate of return because you're you're minimizing a lot of the risk, right? Is is that what I heard on the presentation? Um, in, in an essence, yes. Uh, we fund at uh, basically 70 percent confidence level. So we're funding at a 70 percent confidence level. You expect it is, is about 50 percent where you want to come in. And we retain those funds within Trendell until you actually hit 90 percent confidence level. So we have all the funds on hand available for any event that you guys may have. After 90 percent, uh, you uh, every year the funds are turned back to the county would have not been used above 90 percent confidence level. So you have the option to bring those back into the county every year, which you guys have, have done over the years. And I know this might be actually a dumb question, but you are insured, right, I mean, for those deposits? Yes. I, I mean, I yeah, we have just had to ask that question. Crime and bond insurance, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Yes. I have one other comment I'd like to make as well is um, um, Trinell Insurance actually received its um, fifth consecutive three-year accreditation with excellence. So I just wanted to highlight that as well to the board is that, you know, they've been doing a really, really good job over the years. It just hasn't been, you know, last year or a few years. It's been continual. So I just wanted to make sure that you're aware of that. Yeah, uh, Trindell was one of the first JPAs in California. They were formed just before CSAC EIA was, and they were the first uh, JPA to receive uh, accreditation through the Kajapa organization, which does uh, accreditation for the JPAs of California. And so they were the first JPA to be accredited. And then also next year they, they did a, an accelerated program where you're, ex you're accredited with excellence. And Trindell, um, since 1997, has been accredited with excellence uh, every year since. And I came on about <coughs> four years ago now. Wow, it's going fast. Um, but the previous executive director, there w has been three. Um, you know, they, they've passed that on, so I was stepping into the shoes where things were really squared away, so that was nice. But it also, you know, ups the ante a little bit and say, okay, Dave, it's got to be accredited with excellence again this next year, which mm -hmm. we just passed, and it's a three-year accreditation, and we'll do that again in two more years. I know the uh, this our county has been involved uh, in uh, getting insurance from Trindale for quite quite a number of years, and uh, I personally haven't had uh, in, heard of anything that uh, has any issues or problems that we've had, and and so I would have to say we're pretty happy with uh, the service that we're getting, and uh, we truly do appreciate mm -hmm. your time uh, this morning, uh, Mr. Nelson, for coming down, and. Uh, given us this presentation. All right. I appreciate it as well. And any time that you have questions, I'm happy to come down and do it. Um, so I'll, I'll review this summary information real quick. Um, maybe it'll generate some more questions, maybe not. But these are 10-year totals on the workers' comp costs. So we're looking at, by county, basically the number of dollars that are spent in workers' comp. And as you can tell, um, you know, the numbers on the right are millions. So there's a lot of money that are getting paid out and workers comp losses. Um, so that's why we, we emphasize, you know, the loss prevention so much because there really is a lot of money to be saved in this area. And it's very important. And it's important that your department heads and your employees know that it's a priority from you guys um, to make loss prevention that it's that important because it really does save the bottom line. So a lot of this, these graphs that shows, it, you know, obviously by size you're going to have a, uh, more losses. So the next one is I divide it by the number of employees in each one of those member counties. And so then you can kind of get a feel for how each county's done um, in their own loss prevention programs. San Benito is doing very well. Plumas County, which is right next to it and has the highest per uh, employee count, is our newest member. They joined in 2008 and, um, you know, changing culture in organizations like turning a big ship in the ocean. Uh, but we're definitely making some changes there and uh, they're heading in the right direction. They'll be bringing their cost per employee down very shortly. You'll be providing uh, the training that they probably haven't had before to reduce that. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting process when you don't have a, a safety culture within your organization. If, if your employees aren't really looking uh, towards, you know, how to do things safely and get home you know, in one piece every night, um, it comes with a lot of resistance at first. So 
you know, we bring a program in and say, hey, this is what we, we think is great, and they're going, oh, well, we don't do that. We just get it done. You know, we want to get get the things done. Forget about all these extra safety stuff that has to go on. Well, in the long run, if you end up getting injured and just getting it done, it just costs more money. So it, it's, it shows up initially with a lot of resistance, and then there's a turning point, and we're starting to see that in Plumas right now where they really start embracing it. And it's really an exciting time to watch an organization change their bottom line just by changing the, the view of how things are done. Uh, the tort claim costs, this is a 10-year total as well. So these are all your um, liability and property uh, suits that come towards you from out, outside uh, entities and, and individuals. So we're handling those. Um, and we divide that per county as well or by number of employees just to give you a, a feel for how how that is Sierra County is really extremely high here but it's mostly because they don't have a lot of employees to divide their costs by so um, actually Ms. mr. chair can you go back to the third slide this one no, the next one workers comp I'm sorry one more that one right there uh, can you provide like a three-year average I like to see a decline instead of just a one bar yeah, we can, we can do trending uh, charts as well, uh, and, I, and I've done that uh, consider a lot of times I can give those to you. But in recent, in the most recent years, uh, you have seen some de decline in San Benito County itself as it starts to taper yeah, off. Yeah, we like to see those sharp trends. Absolutely. And then can you move two slices forward? Like, uh, one more, that one. Liability. Total, total, total tort claims cost, San Benito County is kind of high it is high but remember this we're looking at 10 years uh, we have 10 years saying and there's been um, Jackie and I were talking before the meeting there's been several uh, larger uh, lawsuits that have come against mm -hmm. the county um, you can't always control those but um, yeah that we've had to deal with over the last couple of years mm -hmm. and I'm happy to share with those you know when you if you want to want me to give those to you as well <laughs> But there's been some larger lawsuits that we've had to, had to deal with. Okay, all right, good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Nelson. Appreciate your time. Okay. I guess uh, we can move on to the next item, uh, item 20. Uh, who wants to introduce that? Uh, Matt, do you want to introduce yes, that? Um, Ms. Thompson will introduce that for us. Before the Board of Supervisors is a proposed amendment to Chapter 3.01 of the San Benito County Code to add a work experience component to the qualifications of the CAO to allow the Board of Supervisors greater flexibility in considering yeah, candidates for that position. I'm going to read the title of the ordinance for a record. For the record, an ordinance amending subsection D of Section 3.01. Point zero nine one qualifications of Article Six County Administrative Officer of Chapter Three Point O One of Title Three of the San Benito County Code. Um, the board is asked to make a motion to accept the introduction, waive further reading of the ordinance, and continue this item to October fifteenth, two thousand thirteen, at nine a.m. for adoption. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Supervisor Rivas. Yeah. Thanks uh, for recognizing, um, and thanks for allowing this item to be switched with uh, the Trindell item. <clears throat> and, and I feel very strongly about this issue and, and, uh, and prior to getting into this issue, I wanted to share, <clears throat> excuse me, a personal story. A personal story that I think uh, is somewhat relevant to this conversation and to the issue on our agenda here today. Unfortunately, I didn't get the approval of my mother to share the story, so she'll just have to uh, hopefully not hear about it later on. Um, but I consider myself to be extremely lucky um, you see, I was raised by a single mom, uh, and despite not having a, a father in the picture, I was fortunate to have my grandfather, my grandmother, and my great-grandmother. Uh, I, I, was, I was very fortunate to have them around to help raise me uh, and teach me important life lessons. You see, my mom, and this is the approval that I didn't get from her, so she'll have to forgive me. My mom, she decided to leave college early. You know, she left a year prior to um, when she was set to graduate. And she did this to marry my biological father. 
and despite the fact that, that my grandfather was furious, I mean, you know, when my grandfather was alive, and those of you who knew him, he was, you know, intimate. He was quiet, loving, but he was intimidating at times. He was furious that she would not be completing her college degree. And my mom, while she moved, she moved out of the state. She moved uh, to Las Vegas. She got married, and she gave birth to myself and to my brother, Rick. You know, and she quickly learned, though, that my biological father was not faithful. He was not an honest man. Uh, and so my grandfather, he left San Benito County. He drove uh, to Las Vegas, and he, he picked us up. He picked up. I was two years old at the time. My brother was one. Uh, he picked us up, and he brought us back here to Hollister to raise us. And for the next 18 years of my life, uh, I lived here in Hollister, and I attended local schools. You know, my mom, while she became a secretary at San Juan Elementary School, and in the early 90s, when I was in middle school, she went back to school. She worked full time and attended classes in the evening. Uh, and she did this while raising my brother and myself, because she was driven to finish her college degree, because she wanted to pursue her dream of becoming an educator. She wanted to become a teacher. She worked hard. She paid her own way through school. And eventually, she earned her degree and her teaching credential. And she became a teacher. She still teaches at San Juan Elementary to this day. She even went back to school to get her master's degree at San Jose State University. And, you know, and I remember the days uh, when she was gone because I spent a lot of time with my grandparents. You know, and my grandfather would constantly remind me and my brother of how important it was to go to college. He worked every day to ingrain in our minds, go to college, you have to go to college to make something of yourself. You have to go to college. And now the lessons that my mom and that my grandfather, that they taught me, are the same lessons that we try to teach our kids each and every single day. I, I work at San Bernardino High School. I coordinate two grant programs. And I te I, every single day, I teach this to our kids. We, we teach them that learning is important. We teach them that college is important. We teach them that school, it makes you smarter. We teach them that if you go to school, you'll have a better life. And you'll be better able to give back to your community in the future. Why do we tell our kids this? Why do we tell our students this? We tell them this because hundreds, perhaps thousands of years of human history has taught us that education, education, is the key to advancement. Education is the key to critical thinking and problem solving. The foundation of our democracy and the stability of any civil society is dependent on education. And my fellow board members, that is not my opinion. That is fact. We encourage our kids. We encourage our young adults. We encourage everyone to go to college and learn as much as they can. Because we know the key to advancement and success is education. And I share this personal story with you because it is relevant to the issue and this agenda item here today. It is also a story that we all share in common. You know, it is who we are as Californians, and it is who we are as Americans. We work hard, we study hard, and if you do that, you can achieve excellent, great, great things. This is why I'm so troubled by the discussion we're about to have. How can this board even consider amending our local county laws to eliminate the educational requirement of our county administrator, the top job of the entire county. Under the proposed agenda item, our future county administrator will not need to have attended college or earned a degree. And I did say that correctly. You heard it correctly. Under the proposed agenda item, our future county administrator will not need to have attended college or have earned a degree. This is a person who is responsible for managing over a hundred million dollar budget. The person who was responsible for helping negotiate contracts worth tens of millions of dollars. The person who was charged with managing a staff of over 300 people. <clears throat> and the person who was responsible to help lead this county and give this board, our board, sound public policy advice. This person will not need to have a college degree. If the board approves this measure, we will become the only county in the entire state of California who will have a full-time county administrator who does not have a college degree. 
My job as a county supervisor is to ask one question. How does this proposal, how does this amendment serve San Benito County? That is my job. That is the job that residents of the 3rd District entrusted me with to do what is in the best interest of our county. So that is the question before us as a board. How does this proposal, how does this amendment serve San Benito County? Not how does this proposed amendment serve Robert Rivas or how it serves Anthony Botello or Jerry Munzer, <clears throat> but how does it serve San Benito County? The answer is that this amendment, this proposed amendment, serves this county very poorly. And it clearly diminishes the potential for our, our county's future productivity. It clearly diminishes the importance of education. And it clearly diminishes the public's trust in us as a legislative body. And it puts the future of our county at significant risk. If we all ask ourselves this question, how does this amendment, how does this proposal serve San Benito County, we should all arrive at the same conclusion. And the simple answer is that it doesn't serve us well. It doesn't serve us well at all. And perhaps this change serves one person well, but it certainly doesn't serve this county well. I realize that my comments today may make people unhappy, and it won't be the first time. Perhaps someone or some people in this room have something to gain out of removing this requirement and putting the future of our county in jeopardy. But that's not a concern of mine. My concern is this county. My concern is about the people who live here and about our future. I don't believe in devaluing education, and I don't, I don't believe in devaluing education, but college is important. I also believe that this county deserves to have an administrator who is highly skilled and trained, particularly because they are charged with managing taxpayer money. Think about this for a moment. Should we waive the requirements of a medical school for a doctor because the doctor has some relevant life experiences? I can tell you that, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm sure that I, I'm not going to go see that doctor if I'm sick. Should we waive the requirements for lawyers to go to law school and pass the bar? Probably not. Should we not require teachers to go to school and get a credential? Even a veterinarian must have a college degree. Public administration is a serious business. It's a tough and a complex job. You must have management skills. You must have the budget skills. You must have forecasting skills. You must have an understanding of law and the tax code. You must be keenly aware of economics. Your reading comprehension must be extremely advanced. You must have excellent writing and communication skills. You must be a tough negotiator. And you must be absolutely trustworthy and honest. There are schools throughout this nation that are dedicated to training local, state, and national policy leaders and administrators. That's why all counties in our state have administrators with college degrees. And most even have advanced degrees in public policy or public administration. This is a tough job. This is an extremely tough job. And we need the very best, most highly educated people to fill it. So I urge my, my fellow board members to vote no on this proposal. Uh, it is a bad public policy. And it puts our county and the future of our county at significant risk, it, 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 you know, at serious risk. And this proposed action clearly serves San Benito County and our residents very poorly. You know, and I'm absolutely certain that if the voters of our community were asked to weigh in on this matter, they would, by a very wide margin, vote against this proposed amendment. You know, and while my grandfather is no longer with me and, and, and with my family, I know that he'd be proud of me here today if, if uh, he was still here. You know, proud that I'm speaking up and proud and happy at the hundreds of times that he pushed me and my mom and my brother to go to school and get an education. You know, he never stopped telling us, you know, education was the key. Uh, you know, I can recall his words uh, in Spanish. You know, he didn't speak English, but I could, I could hear his voice now telling me, necesitas ir al colegio. You have to go to college. And my grandfather was right. The hundreds of teachers who live here are right. The thousands of parents and grandparents who live in San Benito County are right. Education matters, 
we need to make the right choice here today. Let's set personal relationships aside, and let's set personal agendas aside, and let's vote with one voice to make this county stronger moving forward and into the future. And with that, I um, am done. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Rivas. Any other supervisors want to make a comment at this time? Uh, Supervisor Barrios. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Supervisor Rivas, I couldn't agree with you more. You are absolutely right on. And that is why I would like to change the wording on the uh, proposed amend, uh, um, ordinance to read that under special circumstances, work-related experience will be considered as equivalent with the requirement to continue university training. I think it's important that we add that to it because that is ultimately what we want. We want to make sure that we get somebody that is trained. But at the same time, we don't want to lose the opportunity to have somebody that do, does have proven track record and experience. Uh, we can get the best of both worlds. Uh, it gives the county an opportunity to, to, to hire or to keep a proven individual, and like I said earlier, with a proven track record. I have been, as a board member, instrumental in hiring people for high-ranking positions for the last 25 years. They have ranged from PhD educated down to folks that are continuing their education and moving up through the ranks. We hire what we feel is the very best, but I haven't always gotten the very best, even with that kind of hiring and that kind of uh, uh, hiring consultants to try to get us the very best. Sometimes we have failed our communities. So um, this ordinance gives us the opportunity to select from a broad range of qualities. And that's why I will support it with the additional wording of requirement to continue university training. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other comments, uh, Supervisor Munzer? Um, I, I guess my only question to, to Supervisor Barrios would be do we need the word university training or just college training? Well, I think we can put college slash university. Okay. I would be I would be very happy to use that as a, as an amendment to the to the ordinance. Because I think Supervisor Rivas is correct. It is important and it's necessary. But Mr. Chair, uh, would uh, higher education be a more appropriate phrase, uh, Supervisor Barrios? Uh, the wording to me is not as important okay. as the intent. It's the intent. Got it. Fair enough. Yes. Yeah. So we can work with council on that and make sure that um, that we do put that as a requirement to continue with university training Mr. or college Chair. training, higher Mr. education Chair. training. Supervisor Rivas. Yeah. Although I uh, appreciate the ideas and whatnot, I you know this isn't a uh, uh, you know in in the points um, what I wanted to address was was you know this isn't a job where you can just learn on the job, unfortunately. And although I appreciate the ideas, you know I cannot and will not support it because I am absolutely against removing the educational requirements and adding any type of flexibility to hire someone who does not have the degree and the training. I just can't do it. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, I, I support the, the uh, idea of Supervisor Barrios. I, I think that's a good addition uh, to our ordinance. And what we're trying to do here from my perspective is to have a wide range of, of a pool or candidates for positions, uh, the CAO position in this case, that is, um, you know, <coughs> reflective, of, you know, of what we need in this county. And um, you know, it's interesting listening to your your, you know, personal uh, story, Supervisor Rivas. I I grew up in, under very similar circumstances. And, uh, you know, over a beer, I think we could compare a lot of notes, uh, <laughs> just, uh, you know, how things kind of turned out for, for both of our lives based on people that we admire and who our role models are. And some of the most accomplished people in my life and who I admire uh, in business, family, uh, community uh, accomplishments, didn't have a college degree, you know, pretty much self-taught and um, worked hard. And one of the things that, you know, I've, I've been saying in, in front of groups 
uh, of late is, and uh, as late as uh, this past uh, Thursday, in, in a leadership group uh, sponsored by the Community Action Board and the uh, Church of Latter Day Saints is that there's two things in life that you need to exceed uh, to succeed with. One is your health, and the second thing is an education. But I really feel a, a third thing should be added to that, and that is hard work. The willingness of working harder than the person next to you. And, um, and in our country, I, I would hate to dismiss anybody uh, from any goal or, or future based on whether they have a couple of letters on a piece of paper from a university. Not all of us uh, have that, that opportunity, unfortunately, and it's, it's tougher uh, uh, to attain than probably ever before. I, I feel sorry for uh, parents and, and, and young people uh, getting out of high school today as it's very, very difficult to get into a college of your choice, the field that you want, and um, it, it's, but that's not to say that we shouldn't strive for the highest qualified person that we, uh, that we need for not only the CAO's position, but any, uh, to the, you know, any position in, in public uh, employment. And, you know, I have a list of, uh, of you know, leaders in our, in our county, and it, it ranges from, you know, as, you know, the assistance of department heads, health and human services, public works, behavioral health, planning, uh, and so forth. And the entire list, you know, sh emphasizes uh, a combination of education, and or experience and, you know, and degrees, you know. And what we're after is, you know, of course, we're making this change to this ordinance uh, to accommodate a person that we feel is well qualified, is proven through work experience, and has been on the job for quite some time doing the, the work anyway. And um, um, and in in the future, it also provides uh, for flexibility to future boards as far as w handling a pool of candidates. So, you know, this doesn't set a re you know lowers the bar by any means. I, uh, that's why I view this uh, change in this ordinance. It does not lower the expectations of this board or, or any other future board as far as what we expect from a, from a CAO. And so that's why I'm supporting this amendment and I, I certainly would support Supervisor Barrios' uh, um, suggestion. Um, and this brings in line what we expect from pretty much all other leaders and, and department heads uh, uh, in, in for this county. So that's where I'm at myself. So, uh, Supervisor Rivas, I, I, you know, I I, I want to be very clear to the public right now, and um, you know, those in the audience, those at home, you know, you can't believe smoke and mirrors. You know, this board, through this action, through this agenda item, is removing the education requirement, plain and simple. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what this action is doing. They're removing the education requirement. You know, and this is about removing the requirement at the benefit of one single person. It's what it amounts to. Uh, 150K is one of the highest paid positions. This, this position is going to make over $150,000, and that's, that is a significant amount of money um, in making this much without a college degree. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, but it's going it, to, it, in my opinion, it's going to send a ripple effect, a very negative, rip, uh, ne very negative ripple effect to um, those workers in our county that have worked hard to earn the degrees and the certifications to earn the jobs that they're currently in, um, whether it's 
you know, entry level jobs at this <coughs> county um, on up. And I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, but I, um, I appreciate your comments, but I just don't agree with them. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Bailiff. <coughs> yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I'd like to, I'd like to thank uh, Supervisor Rios for giving a very down to earth uh, discussion. I, I appreciate those moments. I can understand uh, his position. Um, I always, th I always thought, and I still think today that education is an e is an equalizer, and I totally support that concept. Ninety percent of the time, ninety nine percent of the time, absolutely. I myself have a degree in a, a BS in, a fi uh, in finance and accounting, and and I'm very satisfied. And I'm very happy and privileged to be doing the work that I study for. Uh, my brother, who is a general manager for a for a Melpitas uh, manufacturing company has no degree, and he's a general manager. I have another brother who has a, a master's degree, and is a general manager for a for a company called Kenworth out of Mexicali. Uh, it's across the board. We come to this table with different experiences, different cultures, and different educations, and there are times when we try to hire the best person that we feel can can meet the, the needs of the community. And, and, and I agree with Supervisor Rivas, it, it, it is about uh, removing th that statement, absolutely. <laughs> but at the same time, I feel that uh, as a supervisor, as a member of this community, the board should be given the opportunity to seek individuals out in the community that feel that they, they can come in and, and provide those twos. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, I think uh, we should just go ahead and hear from the public. Bill Freitas. Thank you. Once again, I'm Bill Freitas from SEIU Local 521. Hard act to follow uh, on this discussion, which was very thoughtful very appropriate. SEIU Local 521 and their members are very concerned about what is going on here. Understanding that life experience and things that go on with people count for their ability to do certain things. Unfortunately, I believe that even tweaking this ordinance and the local and our members believe that tweaking this ordinance is a slippery slope. It is clearly a proposal to reduce the qualification of the CAO position. Well, you are currently looking to fill the CAO position permanently. In fact, it seems a little suspicious. Residents of this county should be highly concerned that this board is seeking to devalue and reduce the qualifications of a position that is of the utmost importance and requires a person who will be responsible for balancing and overseeing the county's budget while serving at the pleasure of the board. It is the responsibility of this board to ensure that there is no favoritism and that only the most qualified person is appointed to this position who has an obligation to San Benito County residents first and foremost. And I am not saying that there is favoritism involved here. I'm saying you can get that perception by doing this ordinance, by quote unquote lowering, there's no other way around it, lowering the standard. No other county in California, as Supervisor Rivas has said, has reduced these qualifications due to the sensitive and important job duties and requirements of this position. This county has a recent history with how budgets have been balanced on the backs of workers and the residents who have had to deal with reduced services to the public. The previous CAO left the county and board with a budget that left us with a structural deficit when the county should be on the road to recovery like other neighboring counties. We continue with difficulties and the lack of transparency to the public and the workers or currently being told at the bargaining table to balance your budget on their backs. 
These are the workers who live in your county and who will no longer be able to use their purchasing power in your county, thus further reducing your revenues. Austerity is not prosperity. It is the responsibility of this board to hold to these qualification standards and hire only qualified candidates to the CAO position. This board is beholden to the voters and residents of this county, Here. and we ask the board to do the right thing and lead not to be led by rejecting the amendment to this ordinance. Thank you very much. My name is Jillian Wilson. I live on Kimberly Court. Um, I want to thank Mr. Freitas for his comments. They were very appropriate, and I agree with everything that he said. Um, I just would like to say, in addition to what Mr. Freitas said, that uh, changing the qualifications to fit a person rather than finding a person to fit the position is an extremely dangerous and bad policy precedent. I, I urge you to vote against that um, ordinance. He, Mr. Freitas and, and Supervisor Rivas are right. There's no way around this. You are lowering the bar. You're lowering the bar. There's a reason for minimum qualification requirements, in this case one of which is a BA. I'm surprised it's only a BA at this point. Should be a master's degree or a PhD in my opinion. When you're dealing with a multi-million dollar budget, as well as managing other employees who have master's and PhD level degrees. You should have at least a bachelor's degree. Um, furthermore, if, and I'm, by saying this, that's no, in no way in support of lowering the standard, but if you're going to do that, if you're going to set, if you're set on lowering the qualifications for this position, you should at least open it up to other candidates who are now going to be qualified under the new qualifications. Um, at the very least, to follow equal, equal employment opportunity practices. Um, I have nothing against Mr. Espinosa personally, but I agree with what Mr. Freda says, and this just, it doesn't look or feel right. It doesn't look or feel transparent. It doesn't look or feel um, like everybody in this county has, has been given an equal opportunity to apply for this position or to show that the best and most qualified person has been looked at for this position. Uh, I would urge you to reconsider your positions on this ordinance. Thank you very much. You know, the best proof of the confusion here is that the comments made from the supervisors have absolutely no relevance to this issue. It's not that you're wrong. For every other position, it's very relevant. You should have cross-training. You should allow experience. But you're not, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, I was elected to the Board of Trustees in 1971, and I had the honor of attending a workshop for new trustees. There was a woman that was, uh, gave the workshop that had been a trustee for 30 years. And at the end, she says, uh, if there's one thing I want you to take with you, and that is that the person you hire at the top will be the most important decision you'll ever make. And that's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about, one position. You're not wrong in your comments, but you don't apply it to the top position. I've attended, uh, I've been in research of uh, rebuilding communities for some time. I've attended many, many, many national conferences, and I've spoken to a lot of CAOs and mayors and city managers and so on, and I tell you, I'm impressed. I'm impressed with the knowledge that they had, which is the knowledge that is required. It's not that college makes you smarter, it's that you acquire knowledge. You should be talking about tightening up, not having more flexibility. We're at a point of revolution in this country. We have to rebuild our communities. And the knowledge that is required to do that is very, very broad, very deep, very profound, and very revolutionary. You should be tightening the qualifications. You should require not just a college degree, but at least a degree or a master's in public administration. At least. Besides that, uh, the, the person you hire should not only have the, the, the formal education, but they should have all the research background, uh, the, the, some experience if possible. 
Uh, there are a lot of good people out there. Uh, you're, you're taking this too lightly. I, uh, I had experience in administration for 20 years. And I thought I might want to be an administrator, and so I enrolled in a public administration at the University of Santa Clara and completed over 30 units. I didn't get my master's because I decided I didn't want to do that, but you know, it's a lot of knowledge that has to go into uh, performing this job. Um, I, I think you better be careful. This is the most important decision you'll ever make, and we deserve better than that. In fact, the history of this community has been that we take these things lightly. You know, we, we always have. I've been involved in politics here since I got back from the valley where I was teaching in 69, and, and, and this is the biggest problem we've had in this community. Uh, Mr. Munzer made a statement that's very true, and that is we have to quit being provincial and start looking at ourselves as part of a bigger region, and you just don't keep doing the same things you've been doing forever. Thank you. Anyone else? I got one more, Barbara. Two more. Mr. Oh, two more. I'm sorry. My apologies. I'm just writing stuff. Please excuse me for being late. I did not try to go last. Uh, Marty Richmond, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Marty Richmond from Hollister. I'm glad I can agree with some of the previous speakers on, on one issue anyway. If you change uh, the requirements, you, uh, you need to go back out and let everybody have a shot at it. I think that's just uh, fundamentally fair. This has nothing to do whether I think you should change them or not change them. I just think that's a basic principle of, uh, open, of an open government and a fair opportunity for everybody. Uh, again, I, ha I have no personal relationship with Mr. Espinosa. I think he's a nice guy, but we don't know each other. We're not friends. Um, so that's just the way things should happen. Now, on some of the other issues, I have to tell you, I find myself uh, torn. I would like to uh, have somebody in there with a PhD um, with lots of experience that, so we can look at both their qualifications uh, on paper and their qualifications in function. And I'm sure they're lining up at it for $150,000. I can see the line out there as you described, they're going to do all this work. And I can see the $150,000 people out there, there are 50 deep. Actually, there's nobody out there that's going to work for that kind of money. So either if you want somebody with a big time, big time qualifications, you're going to have to pay big time pay. I mean, let's face facts. So you'll have to decide that. That's your decision because the person will work for you. Uh, I, I do take uh, umbrage with uh, uh, any words to the effect that people with college education are more honest or more trustworthy or any of those things, I find that absurd, okay? There's many crooks that come out of college. They're better crooks because they're well-educated, but there's many crooks that come out with a college degree. Uh, I find it unfortunate that some people don't have one. My parents uh, quit high school, both of them, to go to work during the Great Depression. They didn't even finish high school. I don't have a college degree. Anybody want to take me on intellectually? Name, just name. What do you want to do? Mathematics? You want to do art? You want to do history? You want to do government? Just let me know what you want to take me on intellectually. I don't have a college degree. The United States government saw fit to have me sign for a good portion of the nuclear stockpile in Europe, which I managed, and I personally had charge of those nuclear warheads, and I was trustworthy, courteous, and kind, just like a Boy Scout. And I was also smart, and I am smart, and I hope that doesn't sound too snotty. You don't need a college degree to be smart, and I think somebody mentioned Bill Gates and other people who were damn smart and walked out of college because it wasn't their cup of tea. So I will wrap up by saying who you hire is up to you. However, the fairness issue is on the table. Thank you for your Thank you. Yeah, Marty, you're on my Trivia Pursuit team anytime.
Good morning again, supervisors. My name is Christina Wyatt, as you all know. I'm a resident, a proud resident of San Benito County. Um, <clears throat> but on days like this, it makes me really concerned. I ask you respectively that you not compromise yourself, your staff, the future of this community, business owners, investors, and potential investors in the community by lessening your requirements for our future CAO. The job requires seven plus years of experience in budget, fiscal planning, human and labor relations management, at least three years of supervisor capacity, and a BS and BA or BS plus pre preference for an M a MA or a master's degree in public administration. If Mr. Espinoza is your chosen candidate, I request that you please, um, first of all, you owe the community an explanation why you're unable to successfully recruit and get, get um, one of your recruits to accept a position here in our county. And then also why your timing is of now trying to make a, make a decision versus working with S, Mr. Espinoza to ensure that he has the proper requirements to meet the minimum requirements as set forth by our community. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay. Go on. One more. It's cold here. I'm freezing. Are you cold? Are you cold? I, I, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was going to start my comments with it's freezing in the back <laughs> of the room. Already, I already did for you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> good morning, board. It felt good. <laughs> uh, I'd like clarification on what the phrase actually means, equivalent work-related experience. I don't understand what that standard would set. It's just a vague term or a phrase. Who would be qualified, or more importantly, who would not be qualified to be CAO? Does this phrase open it up to all employees with government experience? Adding this to give greater flexibility sounds good, but what it really does is okay the good old boy backroom deal. Who gets to decide what is work-related experience? This has taken an ordinance that states reasonable qualifications to nothing more than a no qualifications necessary. How did this word change take place? At your last meeting, you had an item on the agenda to appoint a new CAO. This discussion was held in the back room exempt from the Brown Act because you would be talking about a candidate or that is what should have happened. There was no action reported out after the meeting. If you were having a failed recruitment, that needs to be reported. To not report any action and then have a wording change such as the qualifications at your next meeting suggests Brown Act violation. Anyone paying attention knows that the Brown Act is violated at many of your meetings. But hiring a new CAO for the county is too important to have the decision taken place in the back room. Our county needs true leaders. If you believe strongly in this change or any change, have the discussion in the boardroom openly with input from the public. Don't make these decisions in the back room and hide what you are really trying to do with phrases like give the board more flexibility. I don't support this change, but if you're going to make the change, then you have to reopen up the applications to everyone. You have many employees in the county right now that would qualify under this. It's only fair that you give them all the chance. You, and, and you have to, you, you really have to qualify what this means, what this word change means, because what it is now, it's open to any kind of interpretation, and who's going to make that interpretation? It's extremely important that you tie this down. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else from the public? 
If not, I'll close to public comment and, and read it, turn, turn it to the board and um, I'll, I'll begin and some of the, listening to some of the comments from the public. One of the things is that I don't think any of us, all five of us, ha are not taking um, this lightly. We've been uh, working on this diligently for almost a year and um, we certainly um, have worked hard through with the recruitment process with the recruiters, our staff, HR has worked very hard and uh, I would not go as far as saying it was a failed uh, recruitment process. Uh, there was no appointment in the back room and, uh, and there, it's completely uh, within the process and procedure uh, of the county uh, to have discussions amongst the board as far as you know strategies and uh, uh, review of candidates for any of our positions. So, um, you, you know, it's kind of con uh, concerning. You know, the SEIU's comments, uh, you know, and references to neighboring counties and uh, recovery and and so forth. But this county has had to live with a contract without any concessions for a number of years where other counties have been able to get into their contracts and, and deal with it. And uh, prior to this, uh, they had always expressed a concern about the compensation packages that, uh, you know, we have for our leaders in, in the county. and. Uh, you know, this is a small county, will always be a small county, and, you know, PhDs, yeah, we'd love to have PhDs. We probably have, would love to have PhDs offered to the uh, county board of supervisors so we come in here and not make any mistakes, but, you know, and God knows I, I you know, ex made mistakes and learned from them, and uh, we're going, everybody does that no matter what their profession is, um, but, uh, we are very fortunate in the fact that the county is in an improved uh, state of affairs and it's due to the intern uh, CEO and uh, um, I, I think if we had somebody like that in place uh, for a number of years, we wouldn't be kind of struggling along where we're at right now for everybody's sake. And so uh, I, I still think it needs to be noted and understood by everybody that we are not doing anything different than what's required for all our uh, uh, department head leaders in our county. It's any combination of education and equivalent work experience, assistant CAO, director of internal services, any equivalent uh, combination of education and experience. Um, the um, uh, ex, uh, executive director of LAFCO is any combination of e education and experience. That's what we require right now of these department heads. And, and the CAO uh, position is, uh, with, if we adopt this resolution and, and is still setting the bar higher if we had, uh, consider Supervisor Barrows um, you know, suggestion. So, you know, I feel very comfortable about doing this uh, personally, and um, I appreciate all the comments uh, that were was made by the public and concerns. But this is really uh, the first time I felt good about this county in a long time, and it, it's due to the leadership that we have had in the administration as well as the leadership that we have in our individual departments in the direction that we're going in. And I want to stay in that direction personally, but uh, uh, I'll go with Supervisor sure. Rivas. But I have to address a point, um, you know, because, you know, when our board moves forward with this action, I'm, you know, to be candid, I'm embarrassed to be a member of this board. Um, but the chairman mentioned that nothing's been done different, and I disagree. And I disagree because I believe county council shouldn't even be sitting and participating in this room when we have this discussion because he was a listed reference for Mr. Espinoza throughout this process. And you sat through the interview process 
And I, in my opinion, I think that's a considerable conflict. Um, and I think that needs to be addressed and possibly investigated. I'm, it's, not, it's, it's not appropriate. We don't know the, the, you know the amount of influence you've had throughout this whole process, throughout this hiring process, but I think it's significant and I think it, you know, it warrants at least the consideration and, possible, and possibly investigation. So that's when I disagree with the chairman in saying that nothing's been, out of, nothing's been done different. I disagree. Okay. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Just so I can respond to that just for a moment. Um, I have not been listed as any reference for Mr. Espinosa. I'm sorry. I have the files in my, in my um, the original application that was filed through our consultant. You are a listed reference. I believe it's you, Joe Paul Gonzalez, and somebody else. I have the papers in my in my uh, well in my if, briefcase. If no, 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 I was no, no, listed no, no. As you a said you weren't. Well, you were a listed reference. If I was listed as a reference, it was without oh. my knowledge. Yeah. It was without. Well, then you have to talk to Mr. Espinosa about that. But it is a considerable conflict in the concern of mine. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, any other comments from our board members? <coughs> if not, um, I'll entertain a motion for action on Mr. this Mr. Chair, I'll move that Wait we a minute. I wait. think the council has yes. a comment before we yes. can make a motion. Oh, it's, it's up to the board whether you adopt the motion as currently written. If there was any proposed language change, the language has to be read into the record at the time that this, it has to be amended before we do the introduction. Otherwise, we'd have to bring it back for a second introduction. So um, if, you, w if there was consensus on the board regarding that there was a desire for language change, I have s s some proposed language that would mo modify it based upon what the, some of the suggestions were. Do you want me to read that, or would the board just want to make a motion? Um, okay. At, as the one that started to make the motion, I would wish that you read the changes. Okay. In order to reflect some of the comments that were made by the board, we could add a period after the word degree, a master's degree, period, strike the rest of that sentence, strike the words or equivalent work-related experience, and instead add this sentence. However, under special circumstances, work-related experience may be considered qualifying for appointment, comma, with a requirement for the appointee to continue college slash university training to completion of a degree. That's just a suggestion. The board can take with um, and change it if it would like. And I'm okay with that, Mr. Chair. The only thing is that um, former Supervisor Lowe brought up a good point that work-related experience may be too broad. Uh, we can actually say uh, CAO-related experience because ultimately that is what we want, CAO-related right. experience. And so... Um, mm -hmm. I, I think it would be appropriate so that this way it isn't so broad. Mm -hmm. And um, so I would change that okay. because she's absolutely okay. right. It has to be a little more okay. focused. So or would um, administrative experience be a wording that would work, a, a administrative uh, uh, county administrative service? Government administration government administrative experience like CAO or CEO experience yeah that would yeah. be that would be fine because then it becomes a little more specific and uh, because you do want somebody that has that kind of experience mm -hmm. what, 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 what what's the language that the board would like would they like it administrative ex government administrative experience or do you want to list the, the job titles government administrative yeah. is okay with me yeah. yeah if it's okay with the rest of the board it's not okay with me, Mr. Chair. Pardon me? It's not okay with me. Okay. So um, the text that I currently have, have is, however, under special circumstances, government, um, government, governmental, administrative experience may be considered qualifying for appointment with a requirement for the appointee to continue college slash university training to completion of a degree. I'm okay yes, with that. I'm fine with that. So, Barbara, um, I'm on page 149. I want to make sure I'm reading the rec right recommended, recommended actions. So I'm reading what you have down on page 149. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yes. Okay. Sometimes it, these are on two different pages. So, 
I would move, Mr. Chair, that we read title of ordinance for the record with the additions and ordinance amending subsection D of section 3.01.091, qualifications of Article 6, County Administration Officer of Chapter 3.01 of Title 3 of the San Manuel County Code and make a motion to accept the introduction, waive further reading of the ordinance, and continue this item to October 15th. 2013 to 9 a.m. for adoption. As as it was read into the record as amended. Correct. Okay. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. I have one. No. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to item 22, uh, CEO Espinosa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, item 22 is going to be presented to us by Byron Turner. He's our interim uh, planning director, and this is he's going to be discussing with us a uh, contract with uh, Rencon Consultants. So, uh, Byron. Thank you. Uh, Rencon Consultants have provided a proposal to provide contract planning <laughs> services to the county to assist with processing of the entitlements required to process the San Juan Oak specific plan project. Their team will work directly with the county planning department and serve as project manager and oversee and participate in all aspects of the public involvement and agency coordination <coughs> of the uh, assignment. The cost of these services will be paid for by the applicant. The applicant has reviewed the services to be provided and cost and supports this action. It is recommended that the Board of Supervisors approve the contract with Rincon Consultants in an amount not to exceed $58,799 to act as project manager of this project and under the direction of the interim planning director, uh, under the direction of interim planning director and authorize the chair to sign the contract and number two, authorize the, the interim planning director or planning director to approve minor contract amendments authorizing additional work within the 10% contract contingency amount not to exceed $5,879. Okay. I'm available for any questions. Any questions from the board? Seeing none, uh, I'll open it up for public comment. Any questions or uh, comments from the public? If not, I'll bring it back to the board. Mr. Chair, make a motion to approve contract. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. Uh, we'll move on to item 23. Uh, this is our last item, so uh, Byron Turner is going to go ahead and give us a general plan update. So as, as requested, uh, this is a standing item on the board agenda to give you an update of what, where we're at with the general plan update. Uh, we have received two proposals uh, late yesterday. Two proposals came in uh, to uh, assist with uh, finalizing the general plan. Uh, we'll be coordinating with uh, both parties to re refine the scope as necessary and we'll report and, and potentially schedule interviews and discuss the project with them and report back to you as soon as possible in two weeks. Okay. Um, so we have the um, some proposals now. Yes. And how long will, you know, as soon as possible, I know, you know, sometimes that in government speak, uh, that could be months. Uh, are we talking about weeks, days, or? On the 15th, I, it, it's already agendized for the 15th to update you on the process. So I have not spoken to any of the applicants yet. I, we just, these just came in yesterday afternoon. They have not been reviewed. I'm not prepared to speak about the merits of either one of them yet today. So uh, after this meeting, I'll be getting in contact with the two applicants and discussing the project with them and working on, working on a schedule with them to get them in for an interview. Okay. I, I have one question, Mr. Chair. Was the deadline yesterday? Yes. Uh, not today? Not today. Okay. So then those two applicants met the deadline. Yes. Today. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the board? Any questions, comments from the <coughs> public? Uh, Mr. Richmond? Thank you. I'm sorry for the standing <coughs> session. I'm Marty, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Marty Richmond again. Uh, I want to reiterate the, what I said last time on the general plan. Uh, when, you, when you do interview the uh, applicants, I hope one of your major um, issues, one of the major areas of concentration will be to find out who has the ability and the willingness to essentially act as a program manager, whether it's our pro whether it's a program manager who uh, is employed by us or a program manager w underneath the auspices of the uh, person who makes the uh, proposal. 
but someone has to be a central point of contact. Obviously, we can't say to somebody you can't work on something else, but if it's somebody, and uh, I don't know who the applicants are, I have no personal interest in there, no ax to grind, but if it's somebody who's trying to manage 50 projects and we're going to be the smallest one, let me tell you, we're going to wind up exactly where we wound up before I could guarantee it. We have to get somebody who's willing to push, push, push because this is such a big project, there's so much involved, there's so many steps, there's so many times you have to go back and forward again and people come in late with their comments and so on and so forth, they want written answers, they, they deserve written answers by the legal requirements. You must get someone who's willing to get behind this and simply keep pushing through all the fog and all the resistance they're gonna get from anyone on any issue, on any side of any issue, it's not saying anybody in particular who doesn't like anything, they're going to try and slow it down. So you've got to get somebody who's willing to, to, to bowl through that because otherwise you never get a general plan done. It will never be finished. Thank you for your time. Okay, thanks. Um, anyone else from public? Okay, if not, uh, uh, Byron, pretty much a program manager is probably would be you, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then we'd be. I'd be managing whoever it is that we hire. Okay, maybe you'll badger them more than your predecessor. <laughs> okay. Um, any other comments or questions from the board? Okay. Um, with that, did you say you wanted to continue to item twenty four? Uh, yes, uh, the closed session won't be needed today. There's nothing new to report. So if we need a closed session in the future, we'll re-agendize it. Okay. All right. That's great. Um, so with that, I guess we could adjourn. Move to adjourn, Mr. Second. Chair. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, hearing none. Thank you.
need to get email, Robbie. <laughs> Well, luckily, Jerry gets it to you, so that works out. We have a system, she and I. 